I'm, my name is Kenneth Cox, and I go by the Ken, K-E-N. The Koreans liked that real well when I was there because it was easy. It was similar to Kim, which they was very popular. Korean War had started, and so everybody was thinking, well, we're going to have to go to Korea. We didn't even know where Korea was. Never heard of before? Never, never heard of Korea. Well, we may have mentioned a little bit in world history, world geography, but uh, Korea was a little country the other side of Japan. We heard more about Japan because the, the World War II had just ended a few years before this, so uh, a lot of us were almost eligible for the draft in World War II, and we didn't end up, didn't go because we were too young or in high school. In fact, I had graduated from high school in 1947, and uh, so I thought, well, I'm going to get... I'm going to be drafted into the Army. Well, anyway, I wasn't drafted into the Army until three years later in 19, and, well, four years later, 1951. I'm one of three children. I have a brother uh, three years younger than me, and I have a sister 17 years younger than me. So uh, everybody says she's the afterthought. Well, that may, that's fine and dandy, but, you know, as life went through, Sometimes afterthoughts are the best thing that ever happened to you because our sister came in and when my mom and dad were in their senior years, well, she helped out with them. And then I went to high school kind of all over Missouri because my dad grew up during the Depression. I grew up there during the Depression. It was pretty bad because, well, my dad was working, this is when they first started building what we call hard roads, which is the cement roads in all over the United States, but preferably right here in around north of St. Louis. Was about an, I was born and raised in a small town in Lincoln County, Missouri, which is in Troy, Missouri, which is about an hour north of St. Louis. Now, back then it was about an hour and a half because the roads were all two-lane gravel. And so my dad was working on the hard roads, as they call it, the WPA, which is a world, the a work project, and it was a big, uh, that was a thing that Roosevelt started. Yeah. And so uh, my dad couldn't get a job on that because they were hiring older men. My dad was in his early 30s, oh. late, late 20s, early 30s. So he got a job at a factory, make, in a factory making leather gloves was selling them to the government so these guys could use these gloves while they were working for the WPA. At that time, I was um, 20, 20 years old. And so I got my notice, and it said I had to be in St. Louis, Missouri. Well, here I am living in Iowa, which is about uh, five, six hours uh, time drive-wise from St. Louis. And I had to be in St. Louis for such and such a time to take my, take my physical for the draft. This picture right here up in the corner here is a picture of me with, after I'd been issued all my clothing, which was, consisted of two pair of fatigues, two pair of boots, two pair of underwear, and two pair of socks. And I'm standing by the barracks that I'm going to be in for six weeks while I take my basic training. And I took that basic training, and then they turned around and they said, well, soldier, we want to train you a little bit better. So they sent me to he what they call heavy infantry basic, where we learn how to shoot mortars. And his is taken, this flagpole here was in front of headquarters building. And then this one, if you, I don't know, this one, you won't be able to see this one, but that's one of our barracks. We were in what we call the old wooden barracks. The only place you'll see those today is in museums. This was in the summertime. This was in July, and so it was hot. 1951, July. Yeah. You were shipped to Korea. Yeah. Do you remember the date? Uh, all I know, it was July of 1951. And so, anyway, I, we, so we got on this boat, and somebody said, you got to share bunks, and they told me where I, my bunk was, and I I said, how long are we going to be on this thing? Well, two days, because they went around from Tokyo. We went around 
the around Japan and around Korea and came up and we were we end up at Incheon. Well, we got to Incheon and the tide was so low that we couldn't dock that night. We had to wait till the next day when the tide was high so they could come out and get us. So we got in to got on they got up there and our first night on in Korea and we slept on uh, straw mats. They had straw mats laying on kind of bunks, and the chow was. All you can say for it, it was chow. It wasn't the best, but when you're hungry, you'll eat anything. So then they put us on a train, and we're going to from a train then from Incheon into uh, Seoul. Oh no, I take that back. We went from Incheon to Yongdong Po, which was the Yongdong Po was the place where well they couldn't cross the river at that time because they didn't have any. A railroad bridges across the, the Han River. Uh, a company at that time was sitting right next to a railroad track, and the railroad track would the only time they ran trains when was at night, and that thing would really would have made a lot of noise because we were just like 50 foot from the railroad track, and slept on canvas cots, which that's what I slept all the time I was Why in. Did I, they said it was so that they, they couldn't see them. Oh. But that firebox was as big as anything. But anyway, that was what they said. They would run them at night. That's the reason they ran them. That's the real most rewarding was the day that we would give. We had, we had extra food or extra something, and we would give it to the guys that worked for us, our laborers. And most of the laborers were, were kids. I mean, they, would, they wouldn't stand over this tall. Some of them was, well, it's like one day they were singing a song and they were singing uh, a Bible song. And I said, where did you learn that? Oh, the missionaries. The missionaries taught us. So I, I joined in. It was a song that I had learned in Sunday school, so I joined in. Singing. They thought that was fantastic that the GI was singing along with them. They knew the same song, only they sang it in Korean and I sang it in English. Which, it, it was kind of a fun time because uh, they would get to working and if they were doing something where it, it had it took a rhythm to them, well, they would, they would kind of sing a song to do along with the rhythm. And they, they worked uh, in groups that way easier. Some of the saddest times, I guess one of the saddest times and, and one of the most rewarding ones, we would have, we were working in, in the edge of a lot of hills, so not at the, just outside of Seoul downtown, or Seoul period, because at that time, Seoul wasn't near the country, the city that it is today. And they would have a Papa San die, and they would have a big funeral, carrying him out to, and they would bury him up on the side of the hill, and I said, asked one of the laborers one day, I said, or asked the honcho, because the honchos and I were the only ones who could understand him. And I said, why do they bury some of them up there and some of them down here? And he said, well, the higher rank you are in the community, you buried higher, got buried higher up on the hill. I think the most memorable was the, when we built the hospital at Tegu. 25th Evac Hospital, stay in that hospital and rotate back to whatever outfit he came from because uh, they had a full hospital there. And, but that was, a, that, I think that was the most rewarding hospital thing was when I built that hospital. We, I moved in there after working on a railroad siding at Suwon, which is now the biggest airfield in Seoul. But I went from there down to uh, the hospital and I went in there and they said, well, we're starting to, we're going to have to start uh, doing putting electric into the hospital wards. And uh, I said, uh, well, what, what, are, what do we have to do this with? And he said, well, here it is over here. And they opened up the box, and it was the old, what we call knob and tube, which is a single conductor wire, and then you have a porcelain knob, and that holds that wire away from the woods. And I asked, 
and I turned to the sergeant who was in charge of us, and I said, does anybody know how to, and I said, this all we got is knob and tube, and yeah, that's it. He said, you know how to put up knob and tube? And I said, yeah, I do, because when I was in the States, I knew enough about how to put knob and tube wiring in, and so the whole hospital was wired with knob and tube wiring, which is a single conductor wire, or two of them run down side by side, and they put an insulator in about, a, about the size of a bottle cap, and that would hold the uh, wire away from the ceiling and also go down and put the outlets in on the side of the thing. Did you have a celebration after you were done with the hospital? They may have, but I wasn't involved with it. Because I was, by the time we finished the hospital, I was getting near the end of my, in, uh, near my enlistment. It, well, I called it, they said enlistment, but I said in my draft time. So I knew I was getting near my end of my time because the, I was in, uh, a squad leader. What was, the, what was the point? Did you get three points, two points, or what? I don't know. All I know is that I... By being a rear echelon person, I had to serve 18 months. Well, July to July is one year, and July to December is six months. So I had my 18 months in, and I was going home. What was your reaction that you were going to leave the country? Good. <laughs> I said, I've had enough of Korea. I've had enough of Korea because... The people were so poor that they took and flattened out the, we had a lot of beer. You know, everybody drank beer. So they took out and flattened out the beer cans and built a house out of it. Can you imagine building a house out of flattened beer cans? But that's what they do because they had a way of flattening those cans out and making them stick together and they could build enough, enough of a house to keep the rain off of them. And they would build these houses one of them I saw was in a riverbed. I said, why are they building it there? I said, as soon as it rains, they'll wash, the thing will be washed away. They didn't worry about, all they could think about was that they had some place to live because there wasn't that too many places. Tegu had been fought over, but it wasn't fought over like it had been up at Seoul or other places. So uh, it, uh, it was, it was, that was the way it was. But while I was in Tegu, I got R&R. R&R was after you had been in Korea for a year, you got to go, you got to a week in Japan. Yeah. Kind of a, like a vacation. We call it rest and relaxation. So it, that was a big good thing. And I went, home, went to my R&R &R and come back, and everything was just like it was. The only thing is that I had got a... I could sleep late. I slept in the bed. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, when they finished up, we built on the hospital. And so I kind of, somebody, whenever we would finish a ward, well, we'd just take and move into it. I mean, we'd just put two or three squads into the, into the high end of these, into these wards. And somebody came out there one day and saw us living in those squads and they said, in those wards, and they said, you can't do that. You got to move back. You got to be in tents. So we moved back to tents. Not that we really thought too much about it, but it was the idea that we lived through the rainy season in the, in the in the ward. So that was good because tents are not the best thing to live in while it's raining. Oh yeah. <laughs> so have you been back to Korea? Yes, I have. I was there three years ago. Three years. Ago? Yes. I mean, you must be the best person who can have this comparative picture of back then, before and after picture. There's no comparison. There's no comparison because we stayed in Seoul and on, a lot of it was built up because they had had the Olympics there a few years before that. But still now, every place I looked, there were cement roads, and buildings were all the buildings were all out of cement. The uh, uh, very few buildings were less than two less than anyway they were always more than two stories. Yep. A lot of them were 
Some of them were 10, 15 stories. I stayed in the Lottie Hotel in Seoul, and I think we were stayed on the 16th floor, if I'm, a, if I'm not sh mistaken. And two floors were a bank yeah, at, the at, the, at the palace. So, but it was, it was, I couldn't get over how much they had changed. Like, one day I went, came, we got on a bus and they were taking us out someplace to show, show us the uh, Korea. And we had, uh, they were chopping brush down. And they were chopping that brush up and throwing it in, and we were going to just use it for mulch. And I laughed and I said, that's not like the Korea I remember because when I was here, we didn't have any trees. We weren't allowed to, if we needed firewood, we weren't allowed to cut a tree down. If we did, we got a real reprimand from the, well, we got it from the company commander, but it came from the Korean government because we weren't supposed to destroy any trees. Because oh, so there are some regulations from government? Regulations? Well, I guess so, because we weren't supposed to cut any trees down. And so one time we got out there, we were out on a road job, and we were wanting to build a fire, and somebody said, what are we going to use for wood? And this guy said, well, there's a electric pole down there and there's nothing on it and I said what are we going to cut it down with we don't have an axe and the guy said hey I got some dynamite down here and he went down got a charge of dynamite put it around wrapped it around the pole and blew the pole down and we built a fire and we had enough grass and stuff around there we could get the fire started yeah. so you completely different it was so much different that I couldn't hardly believe I was in Korea other than the fact that I knew I was because we had come in on Incheon, and when I came into Incheon, they said, I said, where are, we, where are we landing? They said, we're in landing in Incheon. I said, there's no place big enough for an airport in Incheon. Mm -hmm. Well, we come to find out, they told me then that they had taken, filled in the harbor, and they were, had two big jet strips, and they were gonna build a third, and I said, what then? They said, well, look around. Do you see any hills around here now? Well, they had taken the hills and dozed them off and filled up the harbor, and that's what the strip was. It was quite an experience coming in there because I didn't really know what to expect. I really, I was so astonished, especially when they put us on a bus, and we got out just a short ways out in Incheon, and they go through a toll, toll booth or a toll, it was a, they said something about they had to go through and pay toll. Yep. And I, that surprised me because I said, toll? And then I looked at the highway, and here we're driving on a highway that it's at least four lanes one way. Yep. And an eight-lane road. And I said, I remember this when I said it was a dirt road between here and Seoul. And I said, the railroad. And I said, where's the railroad out here? And they said, well, you don't see it because they moved it away from the road. I was. When I left Seoul in 19, and actually I left Seoul in 1952 and went through Pusan, which is now called Busan, I understand. But you said that you were there up to January 1953. Yeah, I left in January. I spent Christmas at my camp, and I spent New Year's in, in Pusan. And then I went from there to Japan, and I got on a ship to go home. But then when I left Seoul in 1952 to go down to Tegu, there was two bridges across the Han River. One was a railroad bridge, and they had taken and put wood on it so they could drive trucks on it. And the other was a pontoon bridge, or a bridge that my outfit, the 44th Engineer, the Broken Heart Battalion, had built. But now, when I was there, I said something one day I asked to the translator, I said, how many bridges have they got across the Han River at Seoul? 27. I couldn't believe that because, and I said, and I looked at them and they were, some of them were four lanes, some of them were six lanes, some of them were eight lanes. And I said, where's Yongdong Po? The girl looked at me and she says, we don't have a Yongdong Po. I said, well, you used to have one. And she said, well, maybe, I'd, maybe that's part of Seoul now. The south side of the Han River, she said, was part of Seoul. But there is still Yongdong Po. 
Well, that, we never, if we went into Yongdong Po, I never didn't realize it because all I know is we crossed the river and we were in, they said we're still in Seoul. But to me, it was south of the river was Yongdong Po because that's where the quartermaster were. That's where we got, that's where we went to get our supplies and all that. That's where the airport was, which I understand now is a very small airport. Kimpo. You know what, what you did is cool thing for Korea. You are reconstructed, right? Everything, road, bridge, and hospital. Have you talked to your grandchildren or your descendants about what you did during the Korean War? I talked to my boys and my daughter about it some, but, but uh, oh, Dad, what's happening? You know, I mean, they're interested in it, sure, what I did. And especially one of my sons, one of my sons works in construction work. So he was interested in that. But like, just like when we built that hospital, we went out one day and they said, well, we're going to have to start putting up the poles for the line to, to get electric down to all the ward buildings. And I said, that's fine. And Danny, I said, what are we going to do for poles? They said, well, there's a bridge outfit down here. They got some 60-foot uh, pilings. I said, well go down and get some of those, and then I said, well, we can get them and cut them in half and make 30-foot poles on it. But we're looking at poles that big around, whereas we only need one about that big around. So then I said, okay, now we've got what we need from cross arms. Well, what are we going to do for cross arms? And he said, I said, well, we got, we got some four before around here. I said, we'll get the carpenter crew to make us some cross arms. And I said, well, we need braces, cross arm braces to keep the, the cross arm from falling off our getting all tangled up on the pole. And I said, we got some strap iron around here. Yeah, I said, well, we'll get the machine shop to make us some cross arm braces. And we had the bolts. We had big, long bolts. And we cut those in half as if we didn't need that much bolt for it. Well, then I said, OK, now we need some insulators to, ins to put on top of these cross arms. And I said, well, what are we going to do for those? And God said, well, we got the insulators. But I said, got any insulator bolts? That's what you stick in the insulator to hold it onto the cross arm. Ah, uh, we don't have any insulator. We don't have any cross arm insulator bolts. I said, we got any lead? Yeah. I said, well, we'll just melt the lead up and stick these bolts down in there and pour the lead down it. So that's what we did. The engineers, we built everything. Yeah. I always said, somebody said something about, have you ever had to go back in the Army? I said, I'd go back to the engineers and said, why would you go back to engineers? I said, if we didn't have it and we couldn't build it, we would trade for it or we'd go out and steal it. I said, we always ate good and we always slept good because I said, we always made it a point that we took care of ourselves first. It's like <laughs> we, would, we, were, we were working at the hospital. We were working a 12-hour day. So generally, we would start about, 6.30 to 7 o'clock in the morning, and uh, noon chow, chow was at about 12.30, 1, 12, 12, 12, 30, something like that. So in the morning, we would take a break. And so we ran out of sugar. We ran out of coffee. Lo and behold, there was a British outfit down the road from us, and so we traded our tea to them for coffee. Well, then we turned around, and they said, well, we're running out of sugar. And said, well, we got syrup. So we used white syrup for sugar. So I engineering outfit was always the best outfit to be with. But the, and even today, I'm still a member of the 44th Engineers Re Reunion Battalion, and we were one of the longest serving engineer battalions in Korea. We went in there in 1950, and they left in 2007 and loaded all their equipment on boats and they shipped them to Iraq. And then in uh, 2009, 2000, yeah, 2009, they went, came back from Iraq and they went to Fort Carson, Colorado and they decommissioned the 44th Engineers. They became part of a brigade. And I guess that's what the new army is, is, is a brigade. It was something real funny about this hospital. My wife and I were in Hawaii here several years ago. I, I don't remember how many years ago now. And 
anyway, we walked into this restaurant. It was late at night, and we hadn't had anything because we had been doing, been flying because we had went over to another island, came back, and we were hungry. And we walked into this restaurant, and it wasn't busy. And at that time, when we, at that time in Korea, in uh, Japan, in Hawaii, in Hawaii, they, the uh, Japanese were really predominant in, they had bought everything and they were, every time you turned around, they would, you'd run into a bunch of Japanese yeah. tourists. And they were the most discourteous people that I could ever think I ever ran into in my life. Most Orientals are very courteous, but these Japanese tourists were very discourteous because if, I have, was over there with a nephew of mine. He Where stands, was it? this was in Hawaii, in, in, in Honolulu. And this nephew of mine was with me, and he stands about six, five, and weighs about 300 pounds. And they would hit him just like they were trying to knock him over or something like that. They would, so anyway, from finish my story was that we went into this uh, restaurant, and the waitress came up and took our order, and she came back and brought us something, and I said, you're Korean, aren't you? And she said, yes. She said, how did you know? And I said, well, I worked and lived with you people for 18 months, and I said, I thought I could, I think I could tell a Korean from a Japanese because the Koreans have got a little higher bridge on their nose and just a little bit different color than Japanese. And she said, I said, I said where are you from? And she said, Tegu. And I said, oh, Tegu. I said, I was stationed in Tegu for several months. Oh? I said, yeah, do they still have that hospital on the hill between the town of Tegu and the airport? Yes. I said, well, I said, it just happened that I helped build that hospital. Well, she thought that was fantastic, especially when I said they still had the hospital. And this, this has been like maybe 15 years ago. But now the probably I'm quite sure the hospital has been replaced. But anyway, we thought it was fantastic that that I ran into her. She was from Tegu, and I said, I said, whereabouts in Tegu? I said, in, in the city, and she said, yes. I said, well, then you know where the hospital is, yes. Well, then they come to find out, and they were having some kind of a, a ceremony in Tegu the next year after I had talked to her, and she just begged my wife and I to come back and be part of this ceremony, and I said, well, I said, I really can't afford to <laughs> fly back over there, but anyway, it would be it would it would have been interesting to go back and see that because I know like everything else it's changed. Everything in Korea I, I've always said after my visit to Korea I would like to have one half of one percent of the cement business in Korea <laughs> because all the buildings are cement, all the highways are cement. It's quite a place. You have a quite a picture. I looked at it, and there are pictures during your military training camps, and you were, uh, some of them talked uh, about the building project, your buddies and the Korean bus boys. Would you please work with your grandchildren to scan those and to the metadata on it, and please so so and send us so that we can publish in the website? I will do my best. I have to find one when my grandchildren are free. <laughs> yeah. But no, I do have a lot of pictures in here, like the pictures of the hospital. That's yeah. something to see. Yeah, yeah. These these are the valuable pictures that nobody ever seen. And by publishing it those in the Korean War Veteran Judicial Memorial, everybody can see yeah, well, a lot what of American GI did. Well, a lot of people went through the hospital. One through one way or the other. Yeah, uh, but American kids. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, American kids. Well, yeah, it would be interesting to the American kids because they just can't r visualize. Like a hospital. When I, was in, when I went to Korea, hospital was the last thing I ever thought of. And it, it just, yeah, the children today, they don't learn about the Korean and the Korean War to the point that maybe, I, well, I didn't either in high school. I never learned about it. Korea, sure, that's a foreign country. One thing I would like to say is how, how the broken heart got its name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People, they, what is I, broken heart? The broken heart 
came about because when they got to Japan on their way to being part of uh, MacArthur's Inchon, invasion at Inchon, they had to paint over all the numbers on their trucks, all the names and everything, all of identification. Mm -hmm. And as if the North Koreans were going to be able to read all that, but anyway. So they were trying to figure out how they were going to mark all this equipment because an engineering outfit, it's got everything you can think of. We even have to mark our shovels. So the day that they were trying to decide how they were going to mark their equipment, they had gotten a paper from Anison, Alabama, where the 44th engineers had been in training and also building a, rebuilding the camp for a National Guard outfit. And they, they got in the newspaper from Anison, Alabama, and it said, the 44th left many broken hearts in Anison. And here was all this young blood, oh, no. all, the, all these GIs and they, all these young girls, and it was all fresh, and they were, had plenty of money and everything like that. So anyway, they left, but, but they left just almost overnight because they would, the guys would leave their cars, lock them up, and give the keys to somebody and say, my brother or my dad will come down here and, and within the next couple of weeks and pick this car up. Well, they left girlfriends. They was, you'd turn around and they, they, they would get, get, guys were getting married just that quick. So anyway, they had their marker equipment and the guy, the colonel turned around and he said, yeah, we're just a bunch of broken hearts. And somebody said, colonel, that's how we should mark our equipment. And they come up with a broken heart. And wow. today, there's, there's places in today where you, you can, show that to where you can still, yeah. Yeah, I think here, in front of it. I thought I had one in here. There. This is a black and white one of it, but that's... Can you, you unfold it? Is that better? How's yeah. that? So that's how we got the name of the broken heart with that. So everything that we ever laid our hands on, roads, bridges, orphanages, anything. We even built a water tower and it's got a broken heart on it. Well, it's probably been destroyed by now, but everything had a broken heart on it. And some of the guys, you come, you talk to some of the guys that came, that have been in Korea for uh, or duty, they'd say, do you remember seeing a symbol of a broken heart? What do you mean a broken heart? Well, just what I said. You take a lightning streak through the middle of a heart, and that's a broken heart. That broken heart harvested in Korea, and you build the backbone of Korean industry and what it is like. Well, we built a lot of roads and a lot of bridges and let people get around over. We even, we even rebuilt railroads. The Broken Heart is what we are. 44th Engineers. Engineers. Broken Heart. Broken Heart. We built Korea. We helped build Korea. Rebuild Korea. Rebuild Korea. So it's this kind of news, news headline, you know. <laughs> broken Heart. Build the Korean road. Wow. There was a lot of engineering outfits in Korea because there was a lot of stuff that had to be rebuilt because the North Koreans and the Chinese had destroyed so much of it. Great. Any message to young generations in America about the Korean War and legacy of what your sacrifice was all about? <coughs> I, I think a sacrifice, it wasn't really a sacrifice, it was a duty that I went and took care of. And as far as the young people is concerned, have a respect for your elders and have a respect for your job. Do a good job. If you can't do a good job, then get off of it and get something you like. 